First of all, thank you guys for getting up early enough to come. I really appreciate it. It's a little tough when you're the first one in the morning after a very nice, uh, fun awards party last night. Uh, I'm Kathy Fognonetta. I have a very varied background, but mostly it was in the studio system. Uh, I have been an executive at Disney and Paramount. I also have been a story analyst. We are the ones who read all the scripts and books that come in uh, at probably, when there used to be like eight studios. <laughs> I, I've probably worked at, at least uh, all of them at least for a year. I also have uh, uh, exec produced a television series called Beyond the Break. It was on Nickelodeon. And it was not, it didn't do real well, but it, it lasted three years. About four girls who decide to, they're going to be surf, uh, on the surfing circuit. And it was not a bad idea because it was shot in Hawaii. <laughs> so <laughs> it, was a, it was a fun gig for me. Uh, I really love, though, my, my passion is teaching people a little bit more about the business side of screenwriting. You know, people have scripts or books. They think this, it's going to be great television or great features, uh, miniseries, whatever. And then they don't know what to do with it. I wrote my book because I actually had film students or people whose parents had spent like almost a quarter of a million dollars sending them to NYU or UCLA or wherever, and they couldn't take a meeting. I was bowled over. I mean, how do you get out of a very expensive, very well-known film school and not be able to take a meeting? And I think, and, and please excuse me for those of you who, who are millennials or whatever, you, I think a lot of it is because your head is buried in, in the internet and stuff like that. And I think it's hard because you don't meet as many people as I think all the rest of us have done. But I'm going to be changing a few things here, I hope. Uh, first of all, I am going to apologize because this was listed as a panel. And when they contacted me, they said, hey, Kathy, would you mind doing a, a panel on, on something to do with screenwriting? I said, sure, fine. So I sent them in a couple of ideas, and this is the one they picked, which is, you know, uh, creating uh, opportunities and, you know, challenging yourself as a writer. And uh, 10 days ago, I get an email, and it says, okay, we're setting everything up, and so you need a t you'll, you'll need a table and a chair and a microphone. Is there anything else you need? And I said, yeah, uh, can you tell me who my panelists are going to be? Because I wanted to you know, look up their, mm -hmm. their background and find out more about it so that I can ask some questions. And they said, well, you're the only panelist. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this came about, this, this particular uh, workshop is something that I do, and it's a weekend workshop. We only have an hour and a half, so I apologize in advance because I've had to like com compress it, and we aren't going to have time to actually do the exercises because that's what really counts. So that's why I've printed out though all those. Those are all the handouts that I hand out to everybody when I, they take the weekend class. So you guys get that, and you don't even have to pay for the workshop. I usually do. Thank. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm just going to sit down. That's the answer that long. Uh, did anybody come in who hasn't gotten a handout? Okay. One, please, per person. <laughs> and if you haven't, if you came in and you didn't put your name on and email on this little piece of paper, take one. I'm raffling off a copy of my book. Um, first of all, it's really interesting to know that you are not alone when it comes to things like telling people about your project and you get all tongue tied and everything. Uh, so many people come to me and they say, I don't know how to express it. Why can't you just read this? I mean, I've had so many people who've come up to me and said, 
I've got this wonderful story, you know, could you please read it? And I ask them what it's about, and they get tongue-tied. The first thing you need to have is what we call a log line. Um, your log line has to tease the potential buyer and it has to make us want to hear more about your project and what makes it special. Uh, and in many ways, too, what makes you the perfect person to tell that story. Uh, the easiest, most successful method that I have used uh, with my clients to create a log line is by starting out with a simple sentence. Um, and we're going to use Avatar. You can see that on the, on the um, handout. You just start off with X Marine goes on a new assignment. Okay, mm -hmm. that tells us enough about who the hero is. We know that he is the main character and he was a Marine at one point. The second sentence, paraplegic X Marine sent to foreign moon on assignment. Well, so now we know he's a Marine, he has a handicap, and that the story's taking place on a foreign moon. So you kind of get peeped, you know, okay, that's different. Um, Add some more. Paraplegic ex-marine dispatched to a foreign moon to infiltrate a colony of aliens. Now we know what he's up against or what, what the purpose is of his uh, assignment. We know he's going to be encouraging um, the alien life, but we don't quite know exactly what the mission's about. Paraplegic ex-marine is dispatched to a foreign moon in avatar form. <coughs> to infiltrate a colony of aliens who pose a threat to Earth. So that's where we bring in the potential danger or this is what the problem's going to be. Uh, also, the fact that he's gonna be an avatar, in an avatar form, which makes it different. Uh, we go on to, you know, paraple paraplegic ex-marine sent to four moon in an avatar form to infiltrate a colony of aliens who pose a threat to Earth but he eventually questions his mission. We now know there is a crisis or a moral challenge that he's going to have, and that's what makes this particular movie much more interesting than somebody who's just on an assignment. Um, finally, we, you know, paraplegic equus reads, statue to a foreign moon in avatar form, infiltrate a colony of aliens who pose a threat to Earth, but questions his mission when he realizes his, this peaceful new world poses no harm. Okay, so we just, that, that's not bad right there, but this is where you guys need to get a little more creative. Um, you need to sort of finesse it a little bit. So we, maybe the final log line will come out. Assigned to inf infiltrate a potentially dangerous colony of aliens on a foreign moon, a paraplegic ex-marine in avatar form is torn between obeying his orders and protecting the spiritual tribe with whom he has bonded. And then we, on, on this one, I added, his friendship with the female alien deepens into love, and in a final showdown, he must risk all to help the aliens save their homeland. So you could see how you layer it on with each sentence. And it, it, it <coughs> seems so <coughs> simple when you just start off with, it, with just one little sentence. And I think you guys should try it. Um, this is that, a part where I usually have a, a thing where I give you a whole bunch of different movies and you guys can decide to do a, a log line on your own. Uh, one of these days, I'll get Melanie to say, can I do a two-day workshop here? <laughs> and, and, and that way I can correct your, your material. But it's really simple if you start off with just that little paragraph, that little few words and just grow it and grow it. And then use your imagination. But you notice this has, I, I picked Avatar on purpose because it's a more complex movie. It's not as simple as, as some of the, like romantic comedies are a little bit more simple to, um, you know, kind of give to people, get an idea. But this one, when, um, when the producer was doing this, this is what he did. He realized, oh, I've got to think of a way to be concise about it because not everybody might understand it because it's a different breed of, uh, of movie. You want to come up here and get a... <clears throat> oh. oh, okay. And then also, you guys want to fill this up, your name and your email. Thank you. Okay. Now, I'm going to give you three other examples just because 
you know, somebody may, may not have something that's like Avatar. Uh, with Mamma Mia, I started off with the hotel owner prepares for daughter's wedding. So it sounds simple enough. But what happened is I grew it and grew it, and the log line I came up with, in this musical comedy, the owner of a small hotel on a Greek isle prepares for her daughter's wedding, unaware that her daughter has invited three men from her past, hoping one of them is the father who can walk her down the aisle. So, very simple, one sentence says it all. So like I said, sometimes some of these uh, movies are, or some of the genres are a little easier to explain. Um, here's one for the best exotic Marigold Hotel. And I started off with retirees go to India. Because that's basically what, it, what, what the story is about. A group of British retirees are lured to India to live in what they believe is a newly restored hotel, only to discover it's far less luxurious than they thought. But as they are forced to settle in, they slowly allow the Marigold Hotel, the staff, and the culture of India to charm them in the most unexpected ways. So that's the one for that. And King's Speech, which is a very serious, historical uh, kind of movie. I started off with Prince is forced to become king, because that's exactly what it's about. Following the death of his father and the scandalous abdication of his brother Edward, Prince George VI, who suffers from a debilitating speech impediment, is forced to overcome his handicap to become king with the help of his wife and an unorthodox speech therapist. So I hope that gives you guys an, some ideas of how you can grow your log line from a simple sentence. Now, if you look on this second handout, and you, this one, I just did this. These are, are the, the, the main pitching pointers. You can write underneath it whatever catches your fancy while I'm talking about it. Um, this is for what I call the big pitch, like if you have, if you, are lucky enough to have a meeting to go in to talk to a producer, uh, an agent, a production company. Um, you can even do this if you guys have books, if you're going in to talk to an editor and it's an, an actual meeting in their office. Uh, it's used for those situations when you're fortunate enough to, you know, to have a one-on-one -on -one kind of a conversation that's, that's going to last a little longer than just a few minutes. Uh, Usually, I like people to approach the big pitch as a verbal trailer. You know how we all you know, go to see a movie and we look at those trailers of coming attractions. So this is a verbal version of that. Uh, think of it as you would you know, when you go to see a movie. We're all aware that um, public speaking is very high on the list of um, fear factors. Uh, it's right on up there with root canals and uh, tax audits. Uh, and it's actually really close to um, dying, fear of dying. <laughs> That's what it, public, public speaking is right up there with the fear of dying, which I have to tell you, I hope you guys don't ever get to that point that where you feel that much fear. Uh, there are no written guarantees, but I'm happy to say that my writers actually have found these pitching pointers to be very helpful. The first is to be concise. Uh, if you tell a well-told story, it really can open up a lot of, or close a lot of those career doors for you. Uh, most meetings where you go to a production company or to a, an actual agency or to a um, publishing house, they don't last longer than about 15, 20 minutes. It's usually about the average. Your pitch should actually only take three to four minutes at the most. And I know that's not very much time, and especially for those of you writing a book, it's, it's definitely not enough time for most of you, but if you can't tell your story within that amount of time, uh, they feel that your story might be too large and not um, easy enough for the public to understand. So uh, try to allot no more than about three, maybe four minutes for your actual pitch, so keep it, keep it uh, short. Know who your audience is. Uh, research the studio, the agency, the publication house that you're pitching to. What kinds of projects do they produce? And maybe what's more important is which ones don't they produce? 
uh, if you're looking to, put, to uh, pitch your project at a conference, um, I don't know, do you, have any of you ever gone to um, a conference where they have um, pitching available? Because mm -hmm. there, you know, there are a lot of them that, that are out there. Um, also, too, a lot of a new thing that's happening now is they have virtual pitch fests <coughs> where uh, there are certain times when they can line up a bunch of producers or directors and then they do Skype calls with you guys. So, uh, but know your know your audience and know who it is that you're pitching to. <coughs> you know what don't they pitch you? And I'll give you an example. Disney. Uh, wanted to change their, they wanted to expand their point of view, and this is back uh, in the mid-late 80s, because everybody knew them as, you know, Cinderella, uh, Haley Mills, and doing all those, uh, very, very family-oriented. And they wanted to expand it a little bit, but they didn't want to do anything that was, you know, too overtly, uh, they didn't want to do X-rated things or hard R-rated things. And this guy came in, and he started pitching a horror story to me. And <laughs> I thought, okay, is this going to turn into a comedy? Or is this <laughs> going to, you know, what's he going to do with it? No, it was a horror story. And it took place in a horror house. And I just thought, whoa, okay, this guy did not, <laughs> he didn't realize that he, when we said we want to look at some, something different, we did not want to look at things that were in the X-rated area. And I had to tell them that. I had to stop them right there, you know, sorry, but you know, we are not looking for this type of material. And uh, he said, but you, you wanted something different. I, heard, I read it and I said, well, if you looked further in the article, it, you would see that they wanted to keep the image though of having things that are, that are friendly to a general audience and not a specified uh, audience. So um, after you've had your, uh, when you have your pitch, first thing before you even go in there, uh, I hope that you guys will think about some of these questions when, uh, when the pitch is done. So think about the questions you, that you want to be asking afterwards. Do the, if they have any comments or suggestions. See if there's, you know, is there something that they're saying that really sparks something in you that says, oh wow, that's right. Or if it's something where they didn't understand it, you may want to just very briefly in one sentence explain to them, oh, perhaps that wasn't quite clear. This is what really happened or something and you explain it very succinctly. Um, you also want to know if they got a feel for the characters um, and did they understand what the protagonist was trying to accomplish? And did any of the sections of the pitch feel too slow or too fast? This is something you can do when you practice your pitch. Practice it with your friends. Practice it with your family if you want to. Uh, I, I prefer to practice it with my friends or if you have a writer's group, do any of you belong to writer's groups or something? Cause, or, or production, you know, if you guys have a you know, production group. Um, that's a good way because they kind of understand those types of stories. They understand uh, a little bit more about where you might be coming from as a writer. Um, did any sections of the pitch feel too slow or too fast? <coughs> and was the story laid out clearly enough and logically enough so that um, nobody got confused? And is this a movie or TV series? So, you know, or a, a book in a particular genre? Now, those are the things we need to know in a pitch. Okay, uh, this is something I suggest. It's not always something that you might have, but have a backup. Once in a while, people will come in and they'll start to pitch a story and it's just not quite the thing we're looking for. And as was the case when I talked to you about the guy who was talking about the whorehouse, um, I just asked him, oh, well, is there, it, do you have, a, do you have some, another project you'd like to pitch? You know, so sometimes it helps if you have a backup. Now, it could be that maybe it's because like at, at Disney, there are times when, <coughs> like when I had to tell them, you know, we, we don't have anything that's, that's too R-rated or too X-rated for us. Or maybe that we have something similar, uh, a historical novel that ta or a historical book that takes place at the same kind of time period uh, with a female lead. And we already have a couple of projects like that. So don't, you know, be put off. It's just that 
we don't want to also get in trouble if something we have might be too close to what you have. Um, the other thing, the reason why I say have a backup is because if your pitch was fairly well told, every once in a while I will ask somebody, well, what else are you working on? So if you say, I don't have anything else to work, anything else, you've lost an opportunity. So it's nice to have a backup, just in case. Always show some style. Show some enthusiasm is mostly what I mean. Um, don't let your theatrics get over, you know, overshadow your story. And I want to give you uh, an example. Uh, there was a guy who was a very famous Broadway producer who decided he wanted to do a movie, a musical movie of Cinderella. So what he did was he came in, and when he came in, he um, handed me and my colleague uh, two wands. And they're the, if you guys have, have little girls, you know, they're the little plastic ones with the sparkles and they got the little streamers on it, and you, okay. Uh, they handed each of us a wand, and then uh, well, every time it, it came to the part about Cinderella and, and everything, and the fairy godmother, he said he, he, he would point to us and we would have to take our wand and have to go tap it three times. Okay, so we looked at each other, okay, we'll go along with this. Um, so he did the story of Cinderella and in between he was talking about, and here's where a musical number comes in, and here's the fairy godmother entering and he points to us and we go, and he sprinkled, fairy dust, glitter, all over my office. Every time the damn, <laughs> every time we had to do the wand, the glitter, am I, I don't know what the cleaning people thought that night. What was Kathy doing in her office? Was she having a party? What was, you know, it's a true story. I've got a lot of them. I just don't have time to tell them all. But that was one that stuck out in my mind. And, um, I, you know, it's hopefully you guys aren't quite that over the top, but uh, here's a, an example of a writer who did sort of just the right thing. Uh, she had on her phone like the 16 bars of a popular a song from the 60s called Big Girls Don't Cry, and and I, I'm happy to see some of you nodding there because <laughs> I know you know the song. And uh, it, it took her thing took place in the 60s and it talked about a young girl growing up. And so um, she just turned on, and she goes, oh, excuse me, turned on the phone, had the first 16 bars playing, turned it off, and started pitching. It got us in the mood. We knew the time period. We kind of, just by the song, knew kind of what was gonna be happening. Um, the main thing is, you don't have to get go overboard on it, but just show us that when you're pitching, you speak clearly, not too quickly, not too slowly. Um, if you want, it's okay if you refer to your notes from time to time. That's fine. Just please do read it to us. You know, that's really, I think that's the biggest faux pas that that people make when they are pitching. They tend to read things. You want to be able to make a connection with whoever it is that you're pitching to. You want them to know that you're that you know you're serious about your work and you know your work well enough that you don't have to keep reading it. Um, so uh, let's see. Okay, hit the high notes. Uh, you don't need to tell us everything in the story. Uh, we need to you know you need to just, you don't need to describe all the scenes. I I've had people who will go into great details about where they're at, what the country looks like, or the fantasy <laughs> land looks like. And then I don't get a chance to know more about the characters. So um, be careful about that. Just hit the high notes. And here's, here's an example, because from time to time, especially if you're a screenwriter, you might want to refer to where you are in the story as an example for that with Avatar. By the end of Act One, Jake in his Avatar form is nearly killed by a pack of viper wolves. But Natiri saves him and takes him to Home Tree, where her mother Moat decides Jake can be allowed to live with them and learn their ways. So we know where we're at in the story. Number 10, allow time for discussion. The reason why it's only 
three or four minutes is because you want to have enough time to hear what the person has to say about your project. Um, and especially if you're in a pitch fest, usually some of those meetings are only five minutes, maybe ten at the most. And if you're not giving them enough time, you've wasted your time because you don't get a chance to get an, uh, uh, an assessment, a real assessment of what you're doing. Uh, also, we need to know when in, in during this time, do you have a completed screenplay or is it a treatment or do you have a manuscript? Is it a book manuscript you have? Um, and also, if you have a project, is it based on, a, um, on another medium, like a, a, a news story or is it based on a book? Uh, and do you have the rights to it? Sometimes if it's something that's, that's uh, maybe something that happened in the, you know, and you read it in the newspaper, if you're fictionalizing something enough, then you probably don't need to get the rights. It could be like if it's a, say it was a horrendous traffic accident and then things spill out from there. Because that's sort of what happened with the guy who did Crash, mm -hmm. is that um, he happened to see something happening on the Santa Monica freeway or something like that and he just, he just thought, what if there was something like that and all the people involved were of different, you know, had different ethnicities, different stories that they were telling and then follow each of them. And that's sort of how he got the idea to, to sort of explore that, that vision of his about the multiculturalism of Los Angeles. Okay, um, you know, some buyers, may have a busy schedule, they may not be, you know, may not give you too many in the way of comments, they may just say, well, thank you for, you know, for coming or, or you know, something like that. Uh, or maybe they'll say, oh, well, we'll get back to you. And occasionally some will pass on the spot. Uh, but if your pitch was well told, you may be asked to contact them when your next project is close to completion. One of the things you need to be prepared about is, is that, you know, they may be busy and they may not have something, a slot open for your project at that time. Um, number 11, be receptive. That means no, it doesn't matter what kind of comments and responses that you've received about your pitch. Listen to everything they're saying. Sometimes people get so upset, oh, they're not saying that they want to buy it and they get very upset about it. But I think writers need to realize that they can, what they can do is take whatever suggestions or comments and put them in a, a file and look at them from time to time. Uh, and especially if you've pitched it to several different people and the same point keeps coming up, it might mean that there's something there that just doesn't quite work and you might need to work on that particular area. Because so this is a good, you know, it's, it's something that's hard to take when you've pitched and then somebody says, well, they're not going to buy it. Well, sometimes there's a reason why. So, you know, you have to be receptive when you, you hear the responses. Uh, number 12, be prepared. If a producer or an exec shows an interest in your pitch, they may ask to see your script or your manuscript. And if you haven't completed your project, um, ask if they'd like to see a one-page synopsis. A one page synopsis could just be your log line and three short paragraphs. You don't have to give them all the details of how the crime is solved, but you know, if you, it's a mystery. But you know, you can do that if you want to give them just that and just say, you know, uh, well, here's a one pager. The reason why I say a one pager with, with just the bare bones on it, it's enough so that if they are interested, and you haven't finished it, they'll still remember your project when you call them or email them and say, I've completed my project. So that's why I say be receptive and be, be uh, the next thing is, you know, of course, be prepared about that. Um, if the, the, one of the things is that I had, I was at a pitch fest and one of my clients went to pitch a project and there was an agent who called me three days later and he said, you know, you need, I need some help. Somebody pitched a project to me, and I just pitched it at a meeting. And they didn't put their name on it. Oh. <laughs> Be prepared. Uh, the only reason that he was able to contact me is that he, she, the, the writer mentioned that, oh, 
Kathy Fognonetta suggested that I pitch this project to you. If he hadn't mentioned that, agent. Uh, 13, follow up. Uh, I think an excellent way to follow up with a producer, an agent, a publisher, is to send them a little, just a short little thank you note. Uh, yes, you can do emails, but boy, uh, isn't it nice just to be able to, what's this? Oh, it's a nice little note, you know, that's been mailed to me. Somebody took the time to actually write a few lines and just say thanks for the meeting. And you might want to just add, um, I'm halfway through my next project. Uh, this lets them know you're a serious writer. Or I'm taking your, your comments into um, consideration and uh, I plan to make some changes on my manuscript for my book. It lets them know you're serious about your writing and it's kind of a nice way to, you know, to keep in touch and to know that you appreciated them taking the time to talk with you. Number 14, use your time well. Uh, using the mental notes that you hopefully remember from your pitch meeting. Um, some, some writers I know have what they call an idea folder. And uh, it's kind of nice, you know, like when you're doing some small talk, sometimes when you're talking to these people, or if you happen to notice that, oh, look, it, there's, there's some information about that production company. And so, for instance, you know, you find out that maybe that producer is doing a new um, is using a new teen actor in his project. Well, maybe your project, maybe you have a coming of age project uh, that you've been writing and you may want to just, you know, drop a little note or something and make, first of all, do a mental note or put one in your, your computer. But look through the Variety or Hollywood Reporter. Uh, I just think it's, it's that's how, the best way for you to use your time. In, um, you know, in, in thinking about your project and how you can maximize it. Fifteen, don't give up. Um, it's important to keep in mind there's more than one company or network around or public, um, uh, pub, uh, publishing house. So one rejection doesn't necessarily mean, indi you know, indicate a failure. But if you've pitched your project to several different venues, and if the same comment seems to come up, you may want to give serious thought to it because there might be something there that you're just not quite missing it, you know, and that's if you have a writing group, that's when it's a good time to talk with your writer's group and see what they have to say about it. Now, one of my favorite things that my clients use is what I call a pitch outline. So that's what, you'll look at the sample one that we have here of Avatar, okay? Um, most of you, I'm assuming, are familiar with Movie Phone or IMDb. And if you use those, what's great is over on the side, they usually have something that'll say, you know, about the movies uh, that are in the same genre as yours. It's great because they have a little uh, thing that, that says trailer. Now, 80% of the people who go to the theaters make their decision whether they're going to see that movie when it comes out next month from that trailer. 80%. And I think it's amazing if you know, to think about it that, wow, that much attraction. So I tell people to think of your pitch outline as a trailer of coming attractions, only it's verbal. So if you take a look on there, um, <coughs> use, and I always suggest, first of all, use key phrases. Do not use complete sentences. Why? Because I don't want you reading it. I don't want you reading it off and telling me, uh, reading the whole thing to me. And that's a huge problem. You need to be looking at me when you're telling me the story, when you're pitching it to me. And the reason why is I want to see your enthusiasm. I want to see that you know your story and you care about it passionately. And if you're reading it, you tend to lose that passion. And you're losing, and when you lose the eye contact, it makes us kind of feel like, well, okay, maybe they don't know their story well enough. And you know that's not true. You know deep down inside, nobody knows that story better than you do. It's your story. Then you have to prove it to us. And so this pitch outline, I swear, has been very, very helpful. A lot of my clients feel so much better when they have this. So um, use just key phrases, because if you use the complete sentences, you're gonna wanna read the thing. Uh, one of the writers, uh, uh, suggested, which I think is a good thing if you want to do it, and I've done it on here, 
Act one, act two, act three. Because occasionally, listen, I, we're all human. Um, you may kind of lose your way a little bit, and you can look down. You know whether you're in act one, act two, or act three, and you can not look down and just see from that key phrase. It can bring you back to wherever it is that you're on, on in the pitch. Um, people who have an actual text of the pitch it is just such a temptation for you to start reading it, and so that's why please follow what, what, what we said. If we can take a look at this, uh, you do the log line, we've already done that. Act one, paraplegic Jake takes on assignment from late brother, needs money for operation. So we know why he took the assignment. Avatar, Jake meets Avatar team, Grace, Norm, Trudy, Colonel Korich, who feels Navi aliens, danger to earth, uh, Parker in charge of mining. So you know that you're going to be talking about each of them in a little bit. Grace leads the team. The team consists of Norm and Trudy. Colonel Corich is the one who, uh, you know, thinks everybody is an alien, so he tries to get, you know, tries to get him to, uh, tries to get Jake to be on his side. Uh, next one, Jake gets used to Pandora and in his avatar body. Almost dies, saved by Neytiri. It's really just those little short key phrases, and that's Act One. Act Two, he meets other Navi. So we, do you remember the training, the whole training session, and he meets her parents and those warriors, and um, uh, you know, you, you get a sense of the kind of community. That's what you're going to be describing there. Uh, he then the love story, of course, you know, fits in there. He falls for her, realizes that these Navi are really peaceful, wonderful people. And that's uh, when he realizes that carriage is, is really a, you know, he's, he's up to no good and that he actually is planning to attack them. So this is just gives you an example. And I love using Avatar because it's a very complex story, more complex than most stories are. And it's, uh, it shows you how very easily you can get it down to just the bare bones. Okay. Um, what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about uh, fellowships and competitions, if you turn to the opportunities. And by the way, these were compiled, these were compiled <coughs> from all the suggestions. I, I sent out a little email to some of the, uh, my clients, and they came back with some of the programs and some of the uh, script competitions that they feel really work well. Some of them want no more than your money, your entry fee, and then you never hear from them. I mean, you know, and so we want to be careful that you don't get involved in that. But this is wonderful. They, this, the first, first group, especially if you're in television, this is what you need to go, is to, and um, the first three are for TV, CBS, ABC, NBC. They have screenwriting programs that <coughs> mentor you uh, that are strictly for television, and you actually have to meet usually once uh, a week, and you have to make a, a commitment to being in Los Angeles for however long that particular mentoring process is. So um, I put down a little bit of information on there, but I've, you, you've got all of the info you need to go to the websites. Uh, Nickelodeon, especially if you're interested in doing something for family and children, they've got an excellent uh, fellowship program too. Warner Brothers has one that's very, um, it's a little harder to get in and I would suggest it, that you have written at least two or three scripts or be a television junkie or something in addition because uh, when you go here, they really are very picky, very selective, and I believe, um, I've been told though that, that the people who come out of here are, you know, usually have uh, something waiting for them, like they, some of them have gotten agents and managers and stuff like that, so. Uh, uh, there's the Writers Lab, Sundance Screenwriters Lab also, those are, are things to, to look into, and ISA Fast Track Fellowship. Now, next are screenwriting competition. And so a lot of these are just for feature, but some of them, like Big Break, and I, um, 
and a couple of the others. They have it for features and for television. The Nichols is really fantastic. Uh, almost always, if you are a finalist, I can pretty much guarantee that your project will be read by the major studios and the major uh, networks because they have people who will follow that and, and look, look at it. And their judges for the final things are all producers or agents or studio execs. So they're professionals in the industry. You, you are a judge on a professional standard, and that makes a big difference. So these are the rest of the competitions in here. Uh, the Sundance Lab, Script Pipeline, um, Austin has a good one, Universal Pictures Emerging Writer Fellowship. These are some of the other ones. Screencraft is very good. And um, the Bahama one is really interesting. Uh, a, a friend of mine who's a, who won one of the competitions, they sent five, they picked five projects, brought those people to Bahama for a week. Now, how bad can that be? <laughs> that one sounded like really good, like maybe I might even want to, you know, do that. Uh, and they got to meet with, with uh, a couple of people who had projects produced. And so it was, you know, it's more of a retreat kind of um, atmosphere. Uh, also, here's uh, on the next side, here's a couple of the pitch fests. Hollywood pitch fest is one, and another one, virtual pitch fest. I have a lot of foreign uh, clients. And it has proven to be quite good for them because uh, they pitch in their pajamas sometimes because of the time difference. Uh, and it's, it's done by Skype, so you may want to like, you know, maybe not wear a negligee or something, but you know, it's, a, it's fun to do it that way. So you're doing, you're, it's almost like being there. Posting your project. There are websites, and I say, if, even though these are some of them that my clients have used, Still, you have to be very careful. Read all the, all the information that you can on it. Uh, Ink Tip has been around for a long time. Greenlight My Movie, which is the one that Matt Damon started a while back. Um, Simply Scripts, Scripts uh, Spec, Scout. Um, Blacklist is, is also one that's, that uh, in the last few years, a lot of people have used that one. Uh, there are entertainment media groups that are great for being able to network. And uh, I highly recommend Stage 32. They have people all over the world, not just, I mean, there's people in Canada, England, Ireland, South Africa. They have a lot of people in their, in their group. And it's not just for screenwriting. A lot of it is producers, because some of you I know, uh, judging from the projects you've done, you guys are sometimes the producer, the writer, the director. <laughs> all in one. And so it, that, that one might be of a, a particular interest to you. <coughs> Scriptwriters Network is based in uh, the Los Angeles area. Once a month, though, they have meetings. And you may want to be in touch with them, because if you happen to be on vacation in the area, it might be during a time they have a meeting. They always usually have at least one or two guest speakers at their meetings. Uh, and I, I've been a speaker for them, and they're really a lovely group of people, and I highly recommend if you have the opportunity to go to one of their meetings, please do. They're very friendly people, and uh, a lot of them are very good about networking and keeping in touch. Uh, if any of you are, as I mentioned, I know that some of you are directing and producing and doing sound and doing camera work and everything. Uh, these are just uh, resources for entertainment jobs if you are coming to the, the area. It, it kind of has a listing of, of all of that on there. Uh, also too, I am constantly asked, I like such and such movie. How do I get a copy of it? These are the two places I go to, Scriptfly and Scripps. They are the best places to go to get scripts. Mind you, the one warning I have, most of the time they are the shooting scripts. Not always, but a lot of times, they're the shooting scripts. And the reason why I'm warning you is because all of you are doing spec scripts. Spec script is usually more concise. Uh, in fact, most of them I, are usually between 95 to 115 pages in a spec script. Sometimes the shooting script, I mean, I, I hate to think what, but James Cameron's 
script looks like when it's, when it's an actual full script because he probably has all kinds of little informational bits in there on where he wants to insert this and his camera work for that and the director and everything. They, they have all the director you know, things in there too. It, it's probably closer to like 180 sometimes and, and those type of very densely um, uh, and, and com complex movies, it's, it can get up that, that way for a shooting script. So, you know, some of them are spec scripts, but it gives you an idea, though, of what scripts should look like or how they, or just reading how, in the text, how the dialogue moved. And those are things that, that are really interesting to be able to compare. Like if you're doing a romantic comedy, you may want to get Sleepers in Seattle or some classic like that and take a look at how they structured that. So that's all the information that is, is on here. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the some of the things that I think work and don't work in the industry because networking is probably on the top of my list and I think what's great about this particular film festival it is very entry free I mean not entry free but it's very uh, it's very it, it's very relaxed in that everybody feels comfortable about going up to one another and talking. They create opportunities to do this. Uh, not all film festivals are like that, and not all things that you go to that have other filmmakers are going to be as quite as uh, open as this. However, if you build up your networking skills, I think a lot can happen for you. So. Uh, Networking is basically just the fine art of meeting and greeting and getting to know people. And uh, nearly every person in, who is in the industry has to network to some extent. Everybody from producers to assistants, you have to do some networking because that's how you get some of the information. Uh, you know, along with your writing talent, you have to cultivate the relationships that can help to move you on. Uh, I just want to warn you, successful networking is based upon mutual respect. And one-sided self-serving relationships are really discouraged. I have seen people do it, and I've seen them crash and burn. And I've helped sometimes in burning that, because if somebody, I, I've had, a, no one here, thank God so far, has done it like, oh hi, I heard, heard you were in the studio. Can you read my script? Thank God no one's done that. You know, it's, but I've had people who have done that. Even though I no longer work at a studio and I haven't been at a studio for like, like 15, 20 years. But they still feel that they are empowered to be able to do that. So, um, one of the things you have to do is, and I think it's on here too, yeah, the networking tips, is to keep it real. Um, building a community, it means you want you need to see people and be genuine um, and be authentic uh, it's not diving into a crowd getting all your information that you need and then taking off it means really building trust and really cultivating those relationships uh, who are you or what makes you different and I think knowing who you are and what makes you different goes a long way when it comes to networking there are thousands of people out there that are all eager to get their projects out there and, and get their work noticed and get themselves noticed. Uh, and you have to you know, establish an identity. Now one common tactic that I've used with my clients is for them to have their own personal log line, an expanded log line. And all it is is just an interesting three or four sentences that gives others a sense of who you are and where you're headed. So. Here's an example. I'm a military brat. I was born in Spain, went to grade school in Hawaii until I was eight, spent the next four years in Okinawa, and lived in Vietnam and the Philippines during high school. My last five years at UCLA as a film major have been the longest time I've ever spent in one place. But I'm proud to say I can order food and read movies, movie subtitles in five different languages. <laughs> this spurred me to write a special script about a young man who's hired as a caretaker for a crotchety old man who is dying and wants to travel back to Vietnam 
to find the family that took him and saved his life when his plane went down during the conflict. So this shows he has a unique global background and a perspective that's going to show up in his screen. Okay. Example two. I'm in my last year of undergrad studies and started working as an intern for a literary agency. I guess my barista skills at uh, Starbucks have really paid off because in between making lattes for my bosses, they're now having me read and evaluate submissions for some of their top clients. Okay, shows this guy's not afraid to start at the bottom. So he's a gopher. So he's but the guy makes damn good espressos, and <laughs> they're, they realize that this guy is serious. He's in there. He's not complaining. So I, I think it's, it's really great. I mean, and he's putting a past experience to good use. I mean, it's not easy to make a good espresso. Okay, example three. I'm a doctor, but I've always found my happiest moments reading mystery novels. On a self-imposed vacation, I challenged myself to write the first three chapters of a mystery novel and an outline of the rest of my storyline. I became so immersed in it, I ended up writing 10 chapters and an outline for the other 10, using my medical background to create my lead character. In a macabre way, I found out I enjoyed figuring out how to get away with murder rather than saving lives, which is kind of a different way of looking at it. If you're a doctor, you also know what can, the reverse can happen. Um, whether you're just out of college or, or you have years of business experience, um, think of what you have to offer. Think of what kind of, you know, makes you a little different. And, you know, can you speak other languages like that first guy did? Um, are you a major foodie? Uh, do you have an unusual hobby? What is it that makes you just a little bit different from everybody else that stands out, makes you stand out in your, in your group or your circle? Next, establish realistic goals. Realistic means doable goals. There are goals and there are dreams. Uh, both are good to aspire to, but again, you have to look at the big picture. And getting a job in the industry is getting your foot in the door. Goals should be established to you, for you to move your way forward and upward. Just like that guy that was the barista. You know, he was an intern. He was working for free. You know, his job was a gopher, basically. He didn't complain, though. And he did his job well, and he was rewarded because they trusted him to start reading and evaluating some of the top material for their top clients. Goals have to be established to help you move forward, and that's what you need to do in a realistic way. Some of his, uh, he, he told me later, um, I had lunch with him shortly after he, he left that job, and he said that uh, some of the guys who were there were so jealous of him because they were expecting that, you know, they would become an agent in, you know, one or two, one or two months or something. Sorry, uh, but those guys, they, they keep, the agents now keep in touch with this intern. And every once in a while when they need some help on something, he comes in and helps. And more importantly, the guy has one of his scripts options. So, you know, you never know. These things do come, come out every once in a while. Uh, use open-ended questions. Do you guys know what that is? It's, it's a tactic that I, have, um, that I have found very useful. Uh, my father is someone who, uh, he says, you know, Kathy, I remember that when you were little, you, there was something about you, you always, I know your first words were probably mama or dada or something like that, but all I can remember is, I was asking questions. How come, daddy? Why? What for? I was always asking questions. And um, I have to say, if the questions are open-ended, they can be some of the best tools that you'll ever have in getting to know other people. Uh, it means just asking a question where you don't want a yes or no answer. You want to hear more of an expansive answer. Examples. What do you think about a move, maybe a movie or something like that? How would you feel if? What is your opinion of? Where do we start? What's your biggest concern? 
How important is that to you? Could you give me an example? Those are all great openers to be able to talk to someone about different projects. Asking somebody, um, I mean, you know, I, I have, uh, I remember I taught a class and they said, yeah, but if, if we ask questions, they're going to think we're stupid. No, I think it's the opposite. Um, bosses and co co-workers, I mean, they, they keep thinking that that's a sign of weakness or something. Uh, I think the opposite is true. I mean, if you're asking questions, I think it shows genuine interest in uh, wanting to know more and wanting to move ahead. That you're, it shows that you're willing to learn and to you know be out there and to, you know the cons It's not easy being in this industry. It's a crazy business, but the more you find out about it, the better off you are. And asking questions or asking for opinions shows a sign of respect, I think. Um, I think a lot of people, I, I know a lot of ex executives have told me they're flattered when somebody decides to ask for their thoughts or their advice. Um, especially if, it's, if you do it without asking like, you know, a yes or no kind of an answer. Um, another thing to think about, volunteer. I mean, in this present day economy, getting your script or project notice may not automatically happen to you right away, but showing your passion and abilities to, um, to others is, I think it's just as easy as doing something like volunteering. And I'm using myself as an example, although this happened a while back. Uh, I was a receptionist in the legal department at Warner Brothers, and the president of the motion picture division asked if I had time to work, um, work late and to stuff envelopes because he was um, doing a special event. And I was looking at it, not a curiosity, of course. I had to know, okay, what is this? And it was an invitation for a breast cancer fundraiser that he was chairing. And I checked the date of the event, and it happened to be a free evening for me. So I asked his assistant, um, you know, well, are you gonna need any help? It, it turned out that they would for the silent auction table. So uh, they said, yeah, we need a few, a few more volunteers. You know, do you have any friends who are interested? So I recruited a bunch of my friends who were in the industry and, you know, who were secretaries too. And uh, we went and helped with the fundraiser that evening. And uh, what happened is I got a, he buzzed me on the intercom. The big boss cost, called me on the intercom. He says, you know, thank you so much for helping out. You know, I'm bringing in a new vice president and I would like to personally recommend you for that position. <laughs> of course I said yes. And actually that man became my mentor, Dick Shepard. Uh, he was an agent who helped to start, um, it used to be the agency used to be called Creative Management Associates. Uh, it's no longer uh, in business, but he started that. And more importantly, he produced one of my favorite movies, Breakfast at Tiffany's which is a real classic romantic comedy. Um, but anyway, you know, what's, what, what's great too is you can pass things on because the gal who got my position uh, as a swing secretary slash receptionist got my job, my old job. The one, she was one of them that was helping out and I recommended her for the job. So you can see you can kind of pass things on and that's, that's the way you start to build your own community, too. You know, the, the, you don't, I mean, that, that woman, uh, until she passed away, was a very dear friend for many years, and she always said, you know, I never would have, I would never would have, you know, moved up in the world if, it, if you hadn't recommended me. So you have to think of that, you know, you're building your own community. Uh, you know, the, the other thing is, is uh, this is an example of something about volunteering. One writer volunteered to help out at a screenwriting conference, and he had to pick up the agent, and this is, this is good for all, like the film festival. Um, he had to pick up an agent who was giving the keynote address, and so he had to get, go to the airport. Uh, he also had to ferry her back to the airport after the conference. Well, just like here, the agent's flight got delayed because of weather. <laughs> And so the volunteer decided to stay at the airport to make sure that, you know, the agent got on her flight and everything. And 
the flight didn't leave for two hours. But the agent ended up asking him about his writing goals. And as she was leaving, volunteering is, is a good way to do it. Uh, be articulate and well read. Um, if any of you are planning to attend writers' conferences or pitch fest, pay close attention. Um, before the event, read the trade papers or for any up to minute uh, information, like what exec got promoted or moved to another studio or you know, or what actor or actress just formed a new company. Um, and become familiar with the common terms that are used in the entertainment industry. And you might want to scan the weekly film and entertainment trades. Uh, noting which companies or studios are buying what kind of projects. If you don't know someone's credits when you're going to have a meeting with them, do some research on it, especially if you want to find out about maybe there was a, an unfamiliar film that a producer worked on and it might have been something that you might have seen and you can make a comment about it. Oh, by the way, I, uh, I remember when I was, I remember seeing this when I you know graduated from college. I, I saw this film and it really inspired me to do da da da. I mean, the, it's an easy way to be able to open up a meeting, and they know that you've done some research and that you are willing to, you know, you, you look at things in a way that means you're well read, and that you don't, you're not afraid to, you know, actually bring things up. Now, you know, it's real easy to get people's credits and, and we just do research, uh, especially if you're going to a pitch fest or a writer's conference, a lot of times they'll tell you who's going to be there. It's very easy to, you know, I, I know they give you a little like two sentence thing about so-and-so is an agent at da 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 and you could just take that and just go online and find out a lot more about what they've been doing. Um, and again, public speaking, you know it's not one of your strengths because it's usually not anybody's strain. Um, consider taking classes at community colleges or enrolling in an acting, and I strongly suggest an improv class. Want to talk about getting out of your comfort zone? Take, do that. Um, I could only do it for, I only did that one night. I couldn't, I couldn't do it, it was just too much for me. But another possible resource is uh, join Toastmasters. Are you guys familiar with that? Toastmasters has been around for a long time, and several people, especially the, they, they were writers, have told me it has been the best investment they've ever made is joining Toastmasters because they it, now pitching is not, they're not so afraid of it. They're not afraid to go into a meeting and shake someone's hand and talk to them and introduce themselves. It's hard. It's not easy. Most of us are not wired to just be open and to, and to chat with everyone. Okay, um, practice the golden rule. That means do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you want to have your phone calls returned, then make sure, I mean, if you want to have your phone calls returned from someone, then you make sure that you return your own phone calls. If you want help with your career, it means you should be willing to help somebody else too. If someone's kind enough to provide you a lead or a contact, it's up to you to follow up on it, especially if the person has agreed to pave the way for you. Um, maybe they made an introduction or an e, e uh, what I call e-intros, you know, by email. Uh, you're also expected to report back to your original contact and just let them know, hey, that meeting went really well, or, or you know, um, they didn't, they they weren't interested in my pitch, but um, they were interested in this other story that I'm developing. I mean, you know, just, you know, report back to your original contact. So it lets them know that you're serious and it lets them know that you're grateful for opening the door. That's what I mean about don't just dive in and then just forget about somebody. You want to cultivate relationships. To me, networking, I don't like the term networking because it sounds like you're throwing a net out there and just grabbing everything. It, to me, it means building a community of contacts and colleagues. And that's what you want to do. And that's what this film festival does. I'm telling you, I've, I've been to a, over a dozen film festivals and this one really does it. It helps all of you to connect with one another. And they give you so many opportunities to do it. You can't miss, you know, it almost forces you to do it. Otherwise, you're gonna be sitting all, the, all by yourself. Um, also, uh, you know, if, if somebody's helped you, just turn around and try and help someone else too. It doesn't hurt to do that. Uh, you know, 
oftentimes, you know, if somebody's come back to me and maybe something, you know, uh, didn't work out, but they came back and they thanked me, sometimes I'll sometimes think of someone else that I can introduce them to just because they were polite enough to just, you know, let me know how things went. Uh, cultivate Dolphin Networking. It wasn't too long ago that um, networking was often compared to swimming with sharks, and there was even a movie called Swimming with Sharks. Thankfully, it didn't do very well. Uh, I, I have a good friend and colleague, Linda Sager, and if any of you are screenwriters, you probably have one of her nine or ten books that she's published. Linda and I firmly believe in dolphin networking, not shark networking. It means practicing giving instead of just taking and run. It means being as professional as you can be and no matter what the circumstances are. Uh, if someone's nice enough to do you a favor, return that favor or thank them. Uh, it may be the only, you have to look at it, so that might be the only favor that they can grant you. You know, and that's the other thing. You don't want to just keep going back to the same person all the time because then that person's going to start to feel like they're being used instead of being appreciated. So hopefully that's what it is that you can, you can spread it out so that you then become a source for people to also open up that you can, they can come to you. Uh, establish yourself as a resource. Do you remember this, the, the little story I told you about the guy that talked about how his family was in the uh, service and he was, in, he was born in Germany and he lived in Spain and Thailand and all. Okay, I love, I love it when somebody's a resource. This, this guy knew all these different, he knew five different languages. He looked at foreign, I mean, just by that one intro, it helped me to understand He's somebody I would go to if I needed help with travel or if I uh, needed help with, with uh, making a connection uh, with a foreign language or something, you know, hey, can you, you know, can you uh, decipher this for me and tell me, you know, what this, what this says? I mean, you know, be a resource. Uh, another resource is, you know, for those of you who, who went to college, talk to some of the other people that are there that, you know, if you keep in touch with them, find out what they're up to. Some of them may have gone into maybe becoming a doctor or becoming a, I, I have one gal who is now a coroner. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if all of us can say that, but certainly if I had, if I had somebody in, you know, one of my clients said, gosh, I'm doing a mystery, but I don't know any chemistry or don't know, I, I would tell them, go read her book and here's my, here's my friend and I'll introduce you to her and you can talk to her about it. That's what I would do. Uh, so anyway, it just if you know if someone's nice enough to do you a favor, just think of it as the only favor that they may be able to grant you. Um, establish yourself as a resource, and knowing when you're known as a resource, that means others are going to turn to you for suggestions and ideas and advice, which means it keeps you visible to them. Uh, don't be afraid to learn more about your own area. Take pride in and being the go-to person. Uh, this way, if you need a referral in the future, you can feel free to talk to somebody about it. And they won't feel like, oh, you're being, a, you know, you're just, oh, you're, you're just talking to me for info. Uh, follow up. If someone's been especially helpful to you or made a positive um, impression on you during a meeting or at a networking event, you may want to send like a brief little follow-up note of things. Um, the approach is another way to extend your networking after that event is concluded. If a busy producer, agent, or director um, has taken time to meet with you and answer questions or provide some assistance or acknowledging, you know, uh, acknowledging your, some of the, your work, a um, little handwritten note. I know a lot of people say, well, can I just send an email? Yeah, you can do that, but I don't know about you. I, I get probably at least 80 emails a day and some it's not unusual for me to lose someone's <laughs> email in there I may just I may just like scroll past it I just don't realize it uh, it's nice though when you get a little handwritten note uh, the next thing give back give back means if you've landed a writing assignment or a film deal or a, an agent or whatever let your network know about your success it doesn't mean that you're out there bragging. That's not what it means. It, it means you're, you know, I think what you have to do is just you thank them for their advice. 
um, thank them for their support. Support means everything to all of us in the entertainment industry because it validates that what we're doing is not in vain. And that goes for all of us, whether we're consultants, director, producer, acting, writer. We want our work to be validated. And when you have somebody who says, wow, you know, I'm, thanks so much, your advice really helped me do something. That's something that validates that what they're doing, they can continue to do it. Uh, I've had people who have not done that and who have been, you know, just keep coming back. And, and I just very politely say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't help you. It's just, it's, you know, you don't want to ever be used. Um, giving back does have its own rewards, and it'll definitely seal your reputation as somebody others can trust and rely on. Uh, and if you're fortunate to achieve, to achieve some success, uh, practice mentoring and helping others, and always remember to pay it forward. This is something that I personally believe in, and I personally try to, to do. Uh, I do not get paid to do this workshop. I wanted to do this workshop because a lot of times I've found that when, um, even though you may have gone to college and gone to film school, they don't teach you these things. And it's important that you know them because I've had to oftentimes learn them the hard way. So I figured this way, it's easier for me to do this. This is, I'm sorry that it's so, usually we do so much more and I, I love it when I, I'm able to, have you actually do some exercises and I can correct it and help you with your log line and all that. Um, hopefully maybe one of these days I'll be able to come back to your area and, and do something like that because unfortunately film schools don't do this. And um, I know that you know one of these days uh, there will come a time when you're going to be very successful and people are going to come to you and ask you for advice and ask you for your, your assistance or want to know more information about what what the path was like for you. And I hope that you'll be able to think back to some of these these points I've given you and it'll you'll help others. So now it's open to questions. Yes? How important are treatments for your script and how how long should they be um, it depends on of course on, on how on what, what genre? What, what's your genre on your genre? Yeah, a crime movie. A crime thing? Um, I, I would think three, four pages should be enough. Uh, sometimes people tend to, you know, I mean, you can, you can write longer, and if, if by the way, there, there are some people who might request, a production company, if they're interested, might request a longer treatment. So you might want to ask them first, you know, how long, how long a treatment would you like? You know, do how many, and the thing is you have to be careful because you don't want to give away too much and if they read it and then maybe, you know, you might have to worry are they going to lose part of it or whatever. Um, but I, most treatments are usually in the three to five page area. Uh, certainly if you're doing something like James Cameron does, if you're doing Avatar or something like Chris Nolan does with, with uh, Inception, I'm sure that those things were like quite long. But you have to remember, those people are not only writers, they're directors. And so they are uh, looking at every single thing. And so they tend to, you know, don't, don't look at that, that's the way you should do a treatment, unless you're planning to, to be a director in a, a larger, you know, movie. But I would say anywhere from three to five pages is usually enough. I, I just, I don't tend to call them treatments anymore. I call them synopses because that's what it is. One page synopses are good if you want to leave it as a, a, a leave behind. You know, if you go to a pitch fest. How many of you have been to pitch fest? None of you? Okay. Mm. One of these days we're going to have to do something about that. Um, I think that uh, the good thing about pitch fest is that usually they have, uh, at least the ones I've, I've gone to, they usually have a, a, few, uh, a few agents. They have people from the production companies that come out. And uh, gosh, some of them have as many as 50 to 100 people in the industry, network executives, and et cetera. And what's great about it is that you have basically five minutes in there. And you have, you, so you give your pitch in three minutes, they give you their response in a couple of minutes. 
it's a way to very quickly establish you know whether you're on the right track. It would be great if if uh, they started doing that here. I know that they are starting to do it in Atlanta only because I did their pitch one last year and it was phenomenally successful. And the people who took, uh, I, I did the same uh, session. I heard back from 10 of those people and they got their things that where they were able to, uh, the, the, the people asked for it. And two, two things got optioned. So, I mean, it does work. Uh, you do have to pay attention to what's going on in, I guess, the southeast area. Uh, there are film festivals, there are, I mean, but I, I know, I think the one that I went to was sponsored by Women in Film and Television Atlanta, W-I-F-T-A dot org, I think, if you want to look that up. So at Pitch Fest, even if they charge you, there's one in Atlanta, um, but I sort of balked at it because there was like this very high admission fee, um, and, and it, it made me skeptical. It, is that common or? Yeah, and that's it's very common. Um, I know that the pitch fests that, that they have back uh, back in California, uh, those are usually about two three hundred dollars to get in. But they also have sessions like this. They have workshops, and they have lots of networking opportunities. And you can sign up for you know, uh, if you're if you're lucky, you can you can uh, be in line, and you can probably pitch to as many as twelve to twenty different production companies or whatever in, the, in that one afternoon. It's, you know, you can't, you can't do anything for free. It's not, a, you know, I mean, I'm doing this for free. So that's about the only free thing you're going to get, okay? <laughs> but it's, it's one of those things you have to invest in it. Uh, but you have to pay, I mean, they, they have to hire, hire out a venue. Um, they have to uh, provide transportation for somebody, you know, like if they have a special speaker or something, they have to do it. In Los Angeles, it's not so bad because a lot of, a lot of people are there, you know, to speak the, the, like the network execs or something, and they don't have to pay for that. But it's, it, yeah, it's usually about two, three hundred dollars. Also, like I said, um, there's virtual pitch fest, if you saw the, the on the handout. Uh, you just have to pay a certain amount. I think it's. I think they do it per pitch. So I'm not exactly sure what the amount is, but it. You know, they will schedule you for one and uh, or for many if you want to uh, want to pitch several of them. I think it's per pitch, and so you have to you know ca call them, find out. But I've had several people who've used it and they, they found it was very helpful, especially when you, if you've only done one draft or or. Uh, especially one draft of your project. And if you find out that there's two or three people who are a little, who play, you know, said, oh, this one thing, you know, end of act two is just not doing it for me, or there's something there that I'm, I'm asking too many questions, then you know you've got to go back and, I mean, it's, it's a good tool for just for that, just so that you know that the next time that you have to pitch that, you're going to correct that. And you know that that's, that's worthwhile, you've gotten professional advice uh, on that. So you know that mm, this isn't quite working, I've got to work on this. But nothing, there, there isn't very much that's for free. They usually have to, you know, just the venue and everything. Yes? Yeah, on, uh, not revealing too much information, what are some steps, measures we need to take to make sure our work is protected? Well, is it registered? I mean, that's the biggest one right okay. there, registering it. I mean, as simple as, you know, you can do it with the Writers Guild or you can, a lot of people do the, the thing where they mail it to themselves and, you know, other people actually, you know, especially if you, the only thing I would suggest is especially if there are uh, several of you doing a project, which sometimes happens um, when you haven't quite made it yet, there's usually like maybe three or four people. You may want to consider, if you have a friend who's an attorney or something that knows more about copyright and all that, kind of work it out so that you guys don't get into a bit of a fight if there's something happens. Um, that's, you know, that's why I think a lot of people take on being a director, producer, or writer. Is they, they're, they're sort of covered on most of those bases then. Mm -hmm. 
to uh, piggyback on that, uh, is it? It just occurred to me: is it possible you could go to a notary and have a notary notarize that you, you know, presented that at this day? Um, I don't know. Notaries cost money, too, and. You and you, what are you going to do? You can't, if you're at a pitch fest, you're, you're going to see 10 or 12 yeah. people. This is going to be a little, oh, and I need to have this notarized. Can I have your thumb currently? Um, I was thinking prior to going that, that um, you know, going to pitch. I don't think it, no, I, I don't think the notary would be uh, something that, I, I wouldn't. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a chance that all of us kind of have to take when we do, when we do projects. Uh, but you know, if you have an entertainment attorney, that's that's always good. In fact, I know that at a couple of the ones that the pitch fest that I've been to, sometimes they they actually have a, an entertainment attorney that once in a while I'll, that'll come and speak about issues like this, and they'll give you some ideas. Other questions? Yes. In terms of open-ended questions, I wonder if you could mention one or two of the commonest errors that are made in story production or long form novel writing? Um, okay. Well, when it comes to a spec script, uh, I would say probably it's putting in so much detail that you're overshadowing the action. That's, that's one. And or not developing the characters. They de everybody always tends to develop the main character but whatever they're up against, sometimes they forget about that. And there are times when, you know, people will say, well, yeah, so-and-so's the villain, but that's all they say. And we don't get to find out why, really. What is it about the villain that makes him do and act and react? Um, greatest example of, of, of something that really worked well, where, where everybody knows the villain, is, you, you know, if you see Hannibal Lecter, I mean, <laughs> you know, and yet, you know, really, she was, you know, Jodie Foster's character was the one that um, was not as, I mean, you know, she had, they delved into her background and why, what her fears and stuff were. So it was almost like a, you know, a two person play. It was very intimate in many ways. But those two were so, such amazing actors. But that was really a, a case of where it was so well written and you knew everything about those characters and what made them tick. Uh, you can do that when it's something that's more intimate like that, because that's what it was. Is there were so many scenes with just the two of them going at each other. But, you know, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, I, I do think that it's, it's hard to, uh, you know, sometimes I think people don't, and, and you're, you know, your, your minor characters are important too. But don't just put them in just to put them in. And some people also put in too many characters, and it's, uh, uh, I, and this is something too, if you, if you guys have ever done something where it's um, based on a novel or um, a written story or a play or something, see what it, see if it would be better if you could combine characters. That's what, what we had to do one time. Uh, sometimes depending on the budget, and just as an example, this is when the new Disney was starting out, which was back in the mid-80s. Uh, they wanted to quickly establish themselves as doing more adult comedies. And one of the people that they, uh, the two people that they got to do this one project were Bette Midler and Shelley Long. You guys probably, I don't know, hopefully you guys remember who they are, but um, they were doing, and the project was called Outrageous Fortune. And they, um, there were all these, it, the script was just getting out of control because it was so, in, in comedy, sometimes it gets to be very talky. So we had to think of a way to kind of cut it back down, and and part of it was also because Shelley Long is not that freaking funny. That's the honest to God truth. She's not. You you don't hear much about Shelley Long anymore. Bette Midler, you still hear about her once, but she just was not really made to be a, a comedian. And um, so what we did was a combination to help save money as well as to sort of eliminate some of the, the couple of the scenes. Instead of having, there was one scene where it took up two or three pages where she was having, going to talk to her parents, and she was always going and talking to her parents 
to get her out of every every trouble, every problem that she ever had. Mom, da, 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 you know, and it was sort of like getting to be monotonous. So we had to, we were able to scrape out like three and a half, four pages of that by just um, showing one scene of her doing that. And uh, the other scene is um, her just ringing the doorbell to her parents' apartment. And when her parents come over in the intercom, because they could see who she was, sorry, Shelley, we can't give you any more money. That's all they had to say. And so they didn't have to show the people. And they actually, actually what we did is we used a couple of the couple of people that were extras on the set that we were going to film in the next scene. We just had them say that to pretend to be. <laughs> so we didn't have to really, they didn't have, we didn't see them on camera. So you don't, you get less money if you're off camera. So um, that's, all, that's all they did. They just had to say that couple of lines. And it saved us quite a bit of money. And the fact that Shelley isn't that funny. And so we were able to, <laughs> to kind of, you know, compress down her, her part of it. So, you know, the, it's, it's a little, little, you have to weigh things very carefully. And, and you know, once it's in the hands of a studio or a director, it, there's very little the writer can do. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Do you want your pitch to be a full synopsis of the story? I mean, if there's a big reveal somewhere in the story, do you want that included in the, in the pitch? Or do you want to try to reserve that for when they actually read your script? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's up to you if you want to do it. You don't have to reveal exactly how what happens. You could always say something like, you know, uh, uh, after a series of, you know, whatever, you know, uh, so-and-so is able to solve it. You can do that. If there is something that, that really stands out and you want to reveal it and it's really unique, then, yes, you can, you can, you can say it. Uh, but going, especially crime things, it's really hard. Uh, or historical things. I don't know if you have histor anybody has a historical project. That's another one where it's really hard because people are not necessarily always knowledgeable about the history of a particular time or a particular place or a war or whatever it is. And so sometimes people get kind of, when they're doing a pitch, they kind of get wound up about talking about all the historical stuff. And you lose sight of the characters and what their goal is and why that goal is so important to them and why whoever it is that's opposing them so strongly feels about opposing them. So those are the important parts of it. And it's the same thing, you know, with when you have a mystery. Somebody wants it's hard to describe it, you know, they want they want to know the truth. And the other guy want you know wants to commit the crime or what he has in his own agenda. And uh, it's it's you just need to make sure that those are the main people that are there front and center in your pitch and you get you, we feel like we're getting to know them when you're pitching it. Mm -hmm. Can you give away the ending? You can if you want. You can if you want. Sometimes people, I mean, I've had people who would, who would just say, you know, in the end, all, you know, things end well and all that. And it's, it's uh, if these people are really interested, they might say, oh, well, you know, do you want to tell us how it ends or something? And if they ask you, then go ahead. Uh, I have done things, too, in just, uh, you know, the one-pagers. Uh, I did one on, on Sleepless in Seattle, and you can read it in, in my book. <laughs> it says, uh, uh, will they, you know, will they end up together? Let me if I can find it in here. Okay. Yeah, okay, this is the, um, I divided it up into basically three, um, act one, act two, act three, I sort of did. So act three, Annie plunges back into her wedding plans with her fiance while Sam makes plans to spend the weekend with the d decorator, much to the disappointment of Jonah, who sneaks out of the house and takes a flight to New York, hoping to meet Annie at the top of the Empire State Building. Will Sam realize where Jonah has gone? Will Annie listen to her heart? And will Sam and Annie finally meet? That's the problem. That's what I, we, we did on this one picture. Of course, the answer is yes to all those things, but you know, I think you. But in, in something like a romantic comedy, you know, they usually do get get together. Uh, 
And it's just up to you how you want to, how you want to word it. Okay, any other questions? Yes. First off, thank you for all these resources. They're very helpful. But is there one path that you think is, is there one that's become more successful? I think, I think definitely if you're doing television, the mentorship program that those networks have, Nickelodeon, ABC, NBC, CBS, Warner Brothers, those are definitely worth doing. They only take eight to ten people. You're the cream of the crop every year. I used to have to do in Disney, uh, it, which is now ABC Disney, I used to, used to have to read some of those. And I was in on the selection committee. And we used to have them. In fact, I think Disney still does for television and for features. And the one for features, uh, you get to work on your own project as well as sitting in on meetings to find out how the whole process works. So it, it depends. They may have changed things now because I haven't been at Disney for a number of years and there's a whole brand new bunch of people in there that I don't know, but um, that program though is still in effect. So, and it's, it depends on the individual and the project. Is that it? No other question? Uh, <laughs> okay, um, who has not put their name and email on here, on a slip of paper? If you haven't and you want to be in the raffle for the book, then please do. Uh, and then, the one thing I would like to request from you, and maybe you can help me out, is if, um, is if you could take a photo of all of us, because I would love to, to have you guys circle around back here. I'm going to put it on Facebook. Um, and it's also because I have to hold up my book because my publisher um, <laughs> wants me to do this too. But the other thing is it makes a really wonderful memory for me. And you guys should be applauded because you guys came here. After that her wonderful party last night, you made the time and effort and investment in coming down, and I appreciate it. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So, okay.